Hey, my name is Michael Bennett, and I'm here to talk to you about the GPU accelerated machine learning with the OpenShift container platform. I have Diane Federna here, who's a principal software engineer at Red Hat, who will be presenting the performance results from our ML, Ber ML Perf benchmark on this platform. So we'll start with a talk about the introduction to the potential of AI and ML, and then how GPUs can accelerate that We'll discuss OpenShift as an enterprise Kubernetes platform for AI workloads and how the Dell EMC Ready stack provides a validated, flexible um, solution to deploy OpenShift in your data center environment. And then we'll go over the results of ML Perf running on this environment. So to start out talking about AI and machine learning, um, artificial intelligence is a big subject that encompasses many things, of which machine learning is only a subset of what enables artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is also, you know, driven with automation and being able to act on the predictions or the classifications that are made by these machine learning algorithms. And inside of machine learning, there's actually deep learning and neural networks, which are just the most state-of-the-art implementation of artificial intelligence today. And so, and and these neural networks just happen to be very fast to train and um, inference on GPUs. So we'll talk about how the OpenShift platform enables some of that with Kubernetes. Focusing a little bit more on the impact of AI, though, uh, it's been said that if you don't have an AI strategy, that you know your business is going to fail. That AI ops, AI um, marketing, and AI risk compliance are all the types of things that are going to be able to be automated and done with this artificial intelligence that can be faster than a human and more accurate for certain types of use cases. And so the OpenShift platform is with GPU acceleration is designed to speed up your adoption of the necessary technologies to have the infrastructure you need to power your AI applications and enable all your business to realize all of these benefits. Um, it's important to note that when we talk about building out artificial intelligence, one of the reasons that Kubernetes is a great platform is because the actual code that is done to train a neural network or perform inference is only a small part of the total number of components that are needed to have a machine learning and AI infrastructure. You also need configuration management tools, ways to collect the data and verify it, as well as a serving infrastructure once your model has been trained and then ways to monitor that model for drift so that you can ensure that your inference results are accurate over time. And so what we like to do in order to break down the process into a, a journey that can have smaller steps is to first discover the problem that we're trying to solve with artificial intelligence. And usually that's a business problem that we want to solve, not an infrastructure problem. The infrastructure will just be used to run the solution. And so after we have discovered our problem, we will begin to explore what data we have that will help us to train a neural network to assist in um, automating or supporting decisions for that business requirement. And we'll analyze the ROI. Then at that stage, once we have all the data that we know will be useful for the model, we can start running the model, doing A-B tests, and um, trying different neural network architectures until we land on something that is accurate and performant, which we evaluate in our findings. And then finally, we will operationalize the model by deploying it on serving infrastructure and promoting user adoption of the artificial intelligence-backed service. And so bringing all of this back to Kubernetes, we enable it with this um, stack of what we call um, NGC containers. 
which run on this Red Hat OpenShift uh, environment, and then on finally underlying Dell EMC data center infrastructure. And so that delivers you your containers, your GPU acceleration, as well as Red Hat OpenShift for enterprise Kubernetes, and then the NGC software stack from NVIDIA that is optimized for AI model development and training and includes all of the um, latest SDKs like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and CAFE inside of those different NGC software registry. Now to talk a little bit about GPUs accelerating AI. Um, so with this slide, what we're hoping to represent, or what I'm, we're getting across here is that, again, if referring to that earlier presentation where ML code is only a small part of the problem, even inside of the AI application, you know, um, a small amount of the code that is the convolutional, the convolutions in your convolutional neural network and things like that are benefit from being able to be highly paralyzed. And they often actually just represent a very small amount of the code, but by moving them to the GPU, you can see 10, 15 times speed ups versus running the same part of the application code on the CPU. So this is why it's useful to have this GPU accelerated OpenShift environment. A little more on how the NGC software optimizes your usage of NVIDIA GPUs on side of, inside of Kubernetes. Um, again, they have those NGC containers that contain the optimized SDKs and deep learning frameworks, as well as Helm charts to deploy some solutions like uh, Hel Clara Healthcare um, AI and other um, like TensorRT inference server, different toolkits. And then um, Dell EMC offers a wide range of NGC ready systems that are validated to uh, run these NGC containers in the most performant manner. And then NVIDIA goes through the effort of making sure that these stay updated, that they're designed to scale to multi-GPU workloads out of the box, and um, that they achieve state-of-the-art efficiency or accuracy or better for the models that they host inside of the NGC containers. So this is an example of all the different software that goes inside of the NGC layer of the container architecture that we showed earlier. You can see here that they have NVIDIA optimized versions of um, a lot of the different popular deep learning frameworks that they package inside those containers for you. And so we've talked about artificial intelligence and why GPUs and containers are a good choice for developing and hosting your artificial intelligence application. And now I'm gonna to touch on the specific benefits of Red Hat OpenShift for your enterprise Kubernetes environment that's gonna be running AI workloads. So if we look at, again, that process of identifying the problem, gathering data, we want an entire platform to be able to do this on. Again, the ML code only represents a small portion of this um, stack, which is the develop ML model. We still have to gather data, deploy, implement in apps. Um, but of course, in order to do the ML model development and deployment, we'll need um, the ML frameworks like TensorFlow, as well as DevOps tooling like Selden to enable us to deploy those models into an environment where they can be reached at, as an API endpoint. We'll also need to tie in uh, data sources that the model trains on or will be um, running inference operations against. So we have to plumb in those data sources. And then ideally, you know, we would want a platform that is self-service so that our developers can request new containers or pods on demand and um, move things between development environments and production with minimal need to interact with operations teams. Of course, since artificial intelligence workloads benefit from GPU acceleration, we would we'll want to make sure that our um, 
platform has support for GPUs and that our data science teams can get access to them. And then finally, you know, the infrastructure that everything runs on, which in our case is a Dell EMC ready stack for OpenShift with GPUs inside the servers. Um, and so, you know, OpenShift provides all of these um, through a couple of different things we'll talk about here. One is Open Data Hub, which is an operator for deploying things like Kubeflow, Selden, Jupyter Notebooks, and TensorRT. Um, there's the NVIDIA GPU operator, which is responsible for going out and finding the GPU resources in, in the systems. And then um, there's also the different data sources that you'll need to plumb in, which in the uh, OpenShift operator hub, there's um, deployment for many of these. And then being a Kubernetes infrastructure, you can deploy data sources via Helm charts also. Um, so talking about the Open Data Hub, it is a um, operator that Red Hat has for data science tools and deploying them on top of the OpenShift environment. And so it, if you're familiar with Kubeflow, um, you know, it, it does services like that for uh, data science workbench functionality, but it also enables Spark and um, TensorFlow deployments and then logging data to Prometheus and Grafana. So it allows us to deploy all those different components we saw in the earlier slide where the ML code was only a small part of it. Open Data Hub ensures that we can not only run the ML code, but that we can have all the supporting services around it. Um, and so OpenShift is, a, it's a trusted enterprise Kubernetes. Red Hat puts a lot of effort into both upstream Kubernetes release, but then also taking the uh, Kubernetes releases and hardening them and then making them production ready for OpenShift. Um, and Dell EMC works with Red Hat to validate these OpenShift releases on Dell EMC hardware to ensure that our customers have the best experience when they're running OpenShift on Dell. And Red Hat's been the leading contributor to Kubernetes since day one. Um, some of the benefits of using OpenShift for your Kubernetes platform are that it makes an it has an automated full stack installation. Um, they provide Ansible scripts as well as installer tooling for to enable deployment on HCI infrastructure like vSphere or public cloud instances. Um, and then they support auto scaling of the resources like worker nodes inside of your Kubernetes environments. And it's very easy to do updates with one click on the homepage of your Kubernetes cluster manager. Red Hat also um, has certified operators, which are built with the operator framework and then certified through the OpenShift operator certification. At that point, then they can go into the operator hub that is integrated into OpenShift 4, which you can see on the right is a portal right inside of the cluster manager to make it easy to deploy these operators. And they all have different levels of automation that when you drill into them, they show you if it supports, for example, automated lifecycle management or just automated deployment and scaling, things like that. Um, so it's really cool. I enjoy knowing my operators are certified and gonna work when I install them. Um, and then another benefit of Red Hat OpenShift for Kubernetes is Red Hat CoreOS, which is an immutable operating system. With CoreOS, all of the operating system images are managed by the machine operator. And so um, the systems are, or, and operating system configurations get handled with APIs and def configuration definitions. And so the, you don't have to worry about mismatched settings inside of the hypervisor OS that are running your containers and things like that. All right, and then right before we get into the ML perf benchmark results, uh, just a little bit about our Dell EMC ready stack for OpenShift. 
So as I mentioned before, we work very closely with Red Hat to validate the releases of OpenShift on Dell EMC hardware. And we also do scale testing with several racks of equipment to ensure that our reference architecture will scale to any size deployment that customers desire. Um, the design is pre-validated in, in the lab, but we create a lot of collateral that enables our systems engineers to customize and right size the ready stack for customer usage. Um, and you can find on infohub.delltechnologies.com a lot of information, of, like for example, the reference architecture design and deployment guides, some solution briefs and some videos and blogs talking about the benefits of OpenShift. This kind of gives you a high level overview of all of the pieces that have come together for to make this GPU accelerated enterprise grade Kubernetes environment for artificial intelligence. Um, in the center, we have the Dell EMC ReadyStack hardware where we used three PowerEdge R640s as manager nodes, as well as um, different GPU accelerated server options that we have. Um, with the DSS 8440 being a 10 GPU server for dense configurations and the C4140 supporting four servers with NVLink, um, or four GPUs with NVLink, I'm sorry. And then to manage uh, the identification of the appropriate workers with GPU resources and install the NVIDIA drivers um, stack, we have the NVIDIA GPU operator inside of OpenShift and then finally on the right, we have those NGC containers I mentioned, as well as the OpenShift Open Data Hub for deploying the different tooling required to build artificial intelligence applications. All right, and now I'm going to hand it over to Diane to go over the MLPerf benchmark results that we got when running on this cluster. Michael gave us an introduction to the benefits of running AIML models in OpenShift using the Dell Ready stack. Now we'll talk about the benchmarks we ran in the Dell AI Innovation Lab and how we monitored them. We chose the MLPerf benchmarks to validate our REMIS architecture because they are all, all open source, they're created and supported by more than 40 industry and university research organizations, and they're designed to help people choose the right ML infrastructure for their applications. The models in MLPerf are neural networks that train on publicly available data sets. You can go to mlperf.org and download the benchmarks yourself and try them out. Now we'll take a look at the lab setup we had in the Dell Technologies AI Innovation Lab in Austin. On the left, you see the cluster system admin host, which serves as a single entry point into the OpenShift cluster. The OpenShift nodes on the right are in their own private subnet for security reasons. You use the cluster system admin host to gain SSH access into the OpenShift nodes and to administer the cluster. Next, we have the Bootstrap node, which is, um, which is doing the setup of the cluster. And after cluster setup is completed, it can be added as an additional worker node. Then we have three Dell R640 manager nodes, which are the control plane for the OpenShift cluster. And we have, on the right, two worker nodes with GPU acceleration. The C4140 with four V100 GPUs was trained uh, was used for our training benchmarks. And below that, the Dell R740 with 1T4 was used for the inference benchmarks. And now we'll talk a bit about monitoring. So this is how we monitor our, monitored our benchmarks that we were running in the lab. You can see the Dell cluster on the upper left running OpenShift. Next, you see the NVIDIA DCGM exporter that is installed by the NVIDIA GPU operator and exports the metrics from the worker nodes that have GPUs. The DCGM exporter is continuously exporting metrics from the GPU worker nodes. Then the Prometheus time series database scrapes those metrics and puts them into a time series database. And <clears throat> you can roll back and look at those um, metrics later if you have a reason to because they are stored in a database. Um, and then we are continuously displaying those metrics on Grafana dashboards 
that um, we created. So in this case, I created this dashboard uh, and uh, created the queries that we see. Um, but you can also download from grafana.org, you can download pre-created um, dashboards that um, people at Grafana have created. This is another dashboard that shows um, PCI sends and receives and the temperature of the GPUs. So you can view metrics like this, and you can also things, see things uh, that don't relate to the GPUs, such as IOPS and um, the CPU usage. Basically, these are some of the great things that are built into OpenShift that customers love because they can use these graphical interfaces to see uh, what all their, how all their resources across the cluster are being used. They can look at individual pods. You can uh, basically tailor this to report whatever you like, and you can also report metrics from your own applications and export them and have them scraped in the same manner. Now we'll look at the system details uh, for the cluster that we, for the, the worker node that we ran the training benchmarks on. And so you see on the left column, we have the Dell C4140. And this is the hardware and software stack that we had for that worker node. On the right, we have the NVIDIA DGX1 comparator system that we um, used the publish results to you know, measure how well we were doing uh, on, on our OpenShift cluster. So both of these systems have uh, V100 GPUs. The C4140 has four V100s, whereas the, the DGX1 has eight V100s. So we'll explain how that's obviously going to affect our results, uh, and we will, we will account for that. Then you notice that uh, for the software stack, the Dell system has an extra software layer that the, our comparator system did not have. It is running OpenShift and, and gives you all these added benefits. And what we'll see in our results is that even though you've got this extra layer of software, there is uh, virtually no performance penalty uh, that we pay uh, because of that. Uh, we ran a slightly different operating system. We ran Red Hat Core OS 4.3 on the Dell in the Dell lab, and our comparator system was running Ubuntu. Uh, in both cases, we used the PyTorch uh, version that is optimized for NVIDIA GPUs. And on down the line, you see there's a slightly uh, different level of CUDA and CUDA driver that were used in the two systems. And everything else was the same, with the exception of the fact that we had additional software running the entire time that we were benchmarking so that we could monitor our performance so that we could go back and then tune those applications. So now we'll talk about the MLPerf training benchmark itself. And in terms of the types of applications that they focus on in this benchmark, uh, there are computer vision and natural language processing models in this benchmark. So we trained four models. Two were object detection models and two were natural language processing Models, uh, mask RCNN and SSD are object detection, and GNMT and transformer are natural language processing uh, models. So the public data sets are listed here as well uh, that we use to train the models. So COCO is the common objects in context data set created by Microsoft and Cornell, and it contains 300,000, more than 300,000 images that, are, that have objects in them that are labeled. And for the translation benchmark, the public data set we used was WMT, which has over 8 million sentence pairs in German and English that you use to train the model. And um, these sentences were taken from newscasts and parliamentary proceedings. So um, these, these public data sets are the way that you train the neural network. And all of these benchmarks were donated by companies like Facebook and Google, and they are used to solve real-world problems uh, such as uh, Google Translate and applications like that. So along the bottom, we have the timings that we received, and we're going to 
that we had in the lab uh, at Dell, and we're going to compare these timings to the published NVIDIA DGX1 results. So these are our results, and you can see that, okay, again, we need to remember that uh, on the left we have the Dell system, which had half as many GPUs as the DGX1 that we're comparing to, so you would expect um, uh, the training time to take a little bit longer. So um, lower is better for training times for neural networks because you want to train as quickly as we can so that your data scientists can um, get faster turnaround time and try different model settings. And um, so uh, we did really well on MathGuard CNN, as you can see here on the far left, the object detection benchmark. And uh, we also did extremely well on SSD. Um, it took us about twice as long, and we had half as many GPUs. So then going on to the translation benchmarks, they were, slight, they were highly variable benchmarks. Uh, we didn't do quite as well on these. Um, there's a random seed that's used to get these benchmarks started, and that affects the number of epochs that the model takes to train. So if we had run this benchmark more times, we feel that we could have gotten it down to about half as much uh, or twice as much training time as uh, the DGX1. So now we'll look at these, we look at these uh, same numbers on only normalized per GPU. And uh, again, you see like we did better for the mask our CNN, did, you know, equally well in the SSD and not quite as well in the GMT and the transformer benchmarks when you look at it on a per GPU basis. So now moving on. The next set of benchmarks are the inference benchmarks, and this is when you put your trained model to work. You give it queries, and it gives you results. And you have a quality metric that you're aiming for. You, uh, your benchmark fails if you don't meet that quality metric, and uh, all the benchmarks we ran, of course, did meet the quality metric and were successful. So the MLPerf Inference benchmarks have four possible scenarios, offline, single stream, server, and multi-stream. We ran offline and, and server because those are intended um, for uh, data center benchmarking. The single stream benchmark is intended for smartphones and the multi-stream benchmark is intended for embedded systems. So what happens here is you have something called load gen, which generates an artificial load uh, to run the benchmarks. It sends queries uh, to the model, and in the case of the offline scenario, it sends all the queries in one big batch, and then you get the answers all in one batch. And in the case of the server scenario, it uses a Poisson distribution to um, simulate the burstiness of queries coming in that are more uh, realistic to real life situations. So the MLPerf inference results that we are comparing to um, are from the mlperf.org website. You see them off on the right here. And all the published results for these benchmarks had ECC turned off, error correction turned off. Um, so turning ECC off, does give you a performance improvement of 13.14 to 14.29%, depending on the models in this group. But the cons of turning off ECC are that um, single bit memory errors would not be detected uh, or corrected, and uh, double bit errors would not be reported. So um, we decided to leave ECC on. So that is going to slow slow our results down a little bit, but many of our customers in the financial industry or the scientific computing uh, community and uh, any situation where safety is involved, you would want this extra uh, level of security for your data. And basically, it's just cheap insurance that you, you want to keep. So we decided to leave ECC on. 
that you want to keep that in mind when you're looking at the performance results that we present because we're comparing it to a system where they turned ECC off. So these are our results. And you can see that, um, that these are the server results. And um, in this case, higher is better. So we're doing inferencing. We want to answer as many queries as we ha can as quickly as we can. And we are comparing one T4 on the left with four T4s on the right. The other difference between the left and the right is that on the left, we're running uh, OpenShift. And on the right, the comparator numbers that we got from the mlperp.org website, um, they were not running uh, they were not running OpenShift or any other container orchestration platform. So we had an additional layer of software that they did not have. So you can see that um, you know, it should take about, they should be able to do about uh, four times as many queries as we can, and, and that's about right. So if you normalize uh, this server benchmark per GPU, that's what you see here, you see that it, it is about the same, but we are off by a little bit, and that can be accounted for <clears throat> by the fact that we turned ECC on, we turned our error, error correction on just for a little more data safety. So that was the server results. Now if you look at the offline results that we had, uh, again, um, higher is better here, uh, and we're comparing one T4 to four T4s, and you see something similar. Uh, you get about four times as many inference answers when you have four T4s as compared to our one T4 with OpenShift. Then if you normalize uh, per GPU, you see that uh, we we did about the same, just the slight difference between, you know, three to 14% uh, difference can be accounted for because of the difference in our memory correction setting. So we got excellent results, and uh, now back to Michael to wrap up. Thanks, Anne, for that. Um, so just wrapping up, we have a couple of links here. GPU accelerated machine learning with Red Hat OpenShift white paper that goes into more detail about these. ML Perf benchmark and the ready stack that we use to run the solution. We also have our design and deployment guides for the ready stack. And then a link to the AI ML and OpenShift page by Red Hat, as well as the NGC program run by NVIDIA with those GPU optimized containers that we talked about. Thanks everybody for taking the time to listen to our presentation today on GPU accelerated machine learning using Red Hat OpenShift.